The first game I ever played was probably on Atari. I remember playing Pitfall, but I'm sure I played something before that, but that's the first one I actually remember playing, which was going to my mother's friend's house and they had an Atari. We didn't have one. At the time, there weren't like a lot of video game consoles out, so it was like, Atari is like the first major video game console. We actually had one of those like Pong machines, but I think we got it after the Atari, so. I played that a crap out of that because I never actually owned an Atari. It was one of those unfortunate kids that didn't have an Atari. I became a comic book artist and I had a pretty successful career in that, so I didn't really ever think about, you know, the game industry as a profession. I would just like be obsessively playing these games for, you know. <laughs> there was a joke that my comics were like because I was like playing video games all the time. There may be some truth in that, uh, but in the course of my travels and just uh, talking to people at various studios, I would meet game developers um, that are like, hey, we have fans at your studio, can you sign our comics? And I was like, wow, that's so crazy. Like, I'm fans of you guys. And I think Jason Rubin like mentioned uh, Battle Chasers in some Jack and Dexter interview. And I was like, hey, I kind of like know people in the game industry. I don't remember what the first game I ever played was. I have memories of going to my grandma's house. The first console I think I ever touched. I've been almost always been a console gamer. I, I really didn't play, get into PC gaming until much later in life. Um, first console game I ever played was F Highway on Atari 2600, which was just Frogger, except you were a chicken and you could only go up and down, so you couldn't go left and right, but I loved it. Highway and Combat were the first two games I played. And then I got a Sega Master System for my birthday? No, I got a Sega Master System for Christmas, which was like the most glorious Christmas present I would ever get. I would never get another video game console as long as I lived for Christmas, uh, but it was amazing. And I saved up my allowance, and the first video game I ever paid my own money for was Space Harrier for Sega Master System. And so that's really what launched my love of games, and those ultimately led to the games I would want to make as a professional, games like Darksiders and games like Battle Chasers. Me and my friends made a game called Crush Deluxe, which was basically three teams in a space dungeon like playing football, essentially. But there were like teleporters and the ball ran around and you could jump over guys and do all kinds of wacky stuff. And uh, we just, we loved the board game and we we're like, hey, let's just make a computer game. And we didn't even really think about it like, hey, we're gonna start a career in video games. It was just, we want a digitized, digitized version of that board game. And so we made it and we actually sold it shareware. And this is like back when people would like send you an order and you'd send them a disc in the mail and all that kind of good stuff. And we got like a little bit of money. It wasn't like a ton of money, but we had like a little publisher give us a chunk of change to assume the rights of the game. One day there was like some guys that were thinking of doing a startup and they were like, you should do this with us. We need like a art director or whatever. And I was like, huh, okay. You know, like that sounds cool. And so I, uh, started up a company with these guys. It was called Trilunar and it was, uh, our game was called Dragonkind. It didn't take off, but I met some pretty cool people during that and I, I felt like I could stay in it. I did some more work for Marvel, but I kind of already had one. I was like planning on breaking into the game industry. And then one of the guys we worked with in that startup got hired by Dave at Realm and he's the one that was like, hey, we need an art director, and I know Joe, and they're like, oh, call him and see if he'd be into it. I don't remember when I first did 3D. It might have actually been for the Dark Side. That might have been the first time I actually, um, I'm, I'm sorry, no, no, actually, I've totally skipped an entire game I worked on, the X-Art game. Yes, that's where I first did 3D. So I built that whole engine too. So I did the 3D engine, all the networking, all the sound. Like, there were only really like three, well, there were two programmers for most of the project, and then we added a third at the end but I wrote a bulk, probably the bulk of that engine as well. So that was really when I first learned to do engine stuff. And that was kind of like, eh, you know, it was my first engine. And so when I started on Dark Side, it was kind of exciting to start from scratch. And no one would ever do this now because you just use Unreal or Unity. But at the time, that wasn't an option. You had to literally build your own engine. So it was fun sort of architecting that and building it from the ground up. I ended up going to the Art Institute of Phoenix, moving from central Illinois, where I had more or less grown up, to, to Phoenix. And while I was there, I got an internship at a, a small PC-focused um, studio called Professor Fogg's Workshop. And it was that internship there that basically started this long chain reaction that has led me here. Because at that internship, I met guys who would eventually move on to go 
work at Realm. Then I became an internship, uh, an intern at Realm Interactive, which is where I met Dave and Joe. A couple of us had met uh, at uh, David Adams' company in Phoenix, Realm Interactive. I was actually working remotely for them as an art director. I lived in New York at the time, and um, that was not working out real well. So I ended up uh, moving out to Phoenix for a while, and they. Shortly after that, they got bought out by NCSoft, which brought us all to Austin. And um, for various reasons, things weren't super exciting uh, there for, for the transplanted team. Yeah, we were working at NCSoft, and me, uh, me and Joe, actually, Joe Madureira, um, put in our notice and left first. And I'd been kind of working on uh, an engine at home just in my free time. It wasn't really much at the time, so I quit, went full time and sort of built the engine that Darkshires would eventually, Darkshires 1 and 2 and Darkshires 2 would be built on. You know, Dave had mentioned to me like, hey, you should come over and check out this engine I'm developing on the side. And it was doing all this badass lighting and everything. And we kind of like were thinking, wouldn't it be so awesome to do our own thing? You know, we didn't even have any concept of how that would play out or anything. But, you know, I think that enough of us were uh, excited enough about the idea to at least start thinking about it and yeah we it moved pretty quickly after that. Joe was just drawing all kinds of crazy stuff like there were like a million different ideas. We had some weird kid with a robot arm and like some dude with like 16 arms and, or six arms and we went through a lot of different iterations and eventually the other two guys Ryan and Marvin um, quit and joined us and Ryan was kind of like level design guy so he was just blocking out like little blue room levels to run around my engine in and uh, Marvin was doing animations. And so we decided, partially because we didn't know any better, maybe where a lack of experience at the time benefit us was, we just didn't know we couldn't do it, so we just left and tried it. And that's really how, how Vigil was born. The name Vigil came from, well, first of all, naming things is impossible. Uh, it's, it's so hard. Um, even Darksiders, at the time that the name Darksiders was put on a list, I didn't like it. I never liked it. I always considered it a, a, a temp name, but it was the best that we had come up with, and it just never changed. And now, of course, I love it. It means, it really means something now. Uh, but yeah, that was the case of we just had this long list. We threw emails, Word docs that were probably, you know, a couple hundred lines long, just name, 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 trying to figure something out. Dark Shadows was, was probably more difficult than Vigil. Vigil, the name came because I had heard, I don't know if the story is true or not, but I had heard a story that the name Blizzard came about because somebody had just opened a dictionary randomly and put their finger in the book and it was on Blizzard and they're like, that works. And so I kept trying that with the dictionary and I was getting these terrible, terrible names. So my wife, who uh, was in, she was in school uh, for environmental engineering and I just grabbed one of her engineering books and don't ask me why this word was in there, but I opened the book and I put my finger on Vigilant. And I was like, Vigilant? So I threw it out in an email. Everybody kind of liked the name. Joe did a few logos that were really cool. Um, he did like a creepy one of a guy looking in a window. Um, I think that's where the first lantern guy drawing was done. But then we looked for vigilant.com or vigilantgames.com. Somebody had already taken it. I think we emailed the guy too, like, hey, you're not using it. You know, what, what can we give you to take the name? And uh, I think he came back with something crazy, like I'll sell it to you for 50,000. So we said, okay, how about we just change the name? Uh, and so we thought, well, what about Vigil? We just drop you know, the last few letters off, and that was it. And again, it's one of those things that I look back on, because I was sad, Vigilant was so cool, but now, it's like, thank God it wasn't Vigilant. <laughs> we didn't know uh, exactly the kind of game we were gonna make. It, you know, we knew it was gonna be somewhat Zelda-inspired. I think we had the code name, because Dave's engine was called Oblivion. I think uh, it was like Zood for a while. It was like Zelda Oblivion or Death or something like that. It was like Zood a rack -a pop which was <laughs> Zelda, Ocarina, or Death, and then we kept adding things. So the Rack was and Ratchet and Clank, and the Apop was and Prince of Persia. That was the code name for the project. So it was an amalgamation of all those influences. And we just started seeing who we could get that would help out, you know, for very little or no money, as you know, like the way startups go. And when we first started, we don't, it wasn't always Darksiders, of course. It, it went through a number of different concepts. Uh, the one I probably remember the most was uh, Robo Arm Kid, and it was going to be a guy who had a robot arm. And, you know, it, always we were targeting the action adventure mold that had been 
know, sort of established by, by Zelda. That was the game we all agreed all agreed we wanted to make, whether it was Robo Arm Kid with a sidekick or Beast Kid, I don't remember his name, he could transform into different animals. Even then, we knew that wasn't gonna be what we were gonna make, right? We were just like throwing out ideas. We just, that's the one we probably talked about the most, but I don't think we actually liked it. We met a number of times, both when we were at NCSoft and then afterwards, uh, trying to flesh the idea for the concept out. And then it really came together after weeks of deliberation, maybe a month, God, so long ago, it's hard, it's hard to remember now. We had one meeting where I remember we all, like we had like a list of the, the ideas we actually kind of liked and we were like, we're not leaving this meeting until we pick one of these. And so we met at Dave's and we, uh, I think Ryan and Marvin were there and we looked at the ideas and went through them one by one and we're like, yeah, this one's pretty cool. Uh. But we kind of left feeling kind of lukewarm on all of them and then I, I was like, just driving. I really don't know what triggered the idea, but I, it was like, it was like, what if you played the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse? It's like, and that was it, really. I think once Dave heard the idea too, and Marvin, we were like, yeah, we never, we never deviated from that idea again. And everyone was kind of like, I don't know what that means, but it sounds so cool. It had like a sex appeal to it, and um, I think I looked at it. More as like, you know, coming from a comic background, it was kind of like the X-Men version of, of the Four Horsemen, not, not like the in, like biblical angels and demons, but like what if it was like sort of like, had like a comic book tone to it. And even then it wasn't like, we went through, even that went through multiple iterations. It was like, at first they were gonna be like high schoolers at some, at Darksiders U. <laughs> it was like, it was like the WB channel version of the Darksiders thing. <laughs> that was Joe's crazy idea. I was like, eh, I don't know about that, but. We went through several different versions of what even it meant to be the Four Horsemen before we settled on what ultimately became Darksiders. Like, I think we even said like, X-Men meets disaster film meets Lord of the Rings or whatever. But it was enough to like get us excited to the point where we just trashed all the other ideas and we were like, how do we make, let's just develop this Four Horsemen thing. The elevator pitch for Darksiders was easy four-player co-op action adventure game starring the four horsemen of the apocalypse, which was insane, but again, we didn't know any better, so we just we just went with our, really our gut and, and our hearts, whatever we decided we were gonna be most passionate about. The first thing we, I mean, we knew we wanted to do like a, a gameplay prototype that we could show off, so um, we didn't have like a story or anything like that. It was like, what can we make with like no team, you know, how much money can we scrounge up for like this, you know, for some help? None of us had ever made a console game. We knew nothing about making platform games. Um, but we just, we really just kind of sat down and looked at all those games. Like something as simple as just getting a character to jump and feel good. Like you'd think it'd be easy, but it's actually really hard. First of all, you can't use actual physics. If you applied the actual laws of physics to a jump, it doesn't feel right, which is weird because if you do 9.8 meters per second squared, it seems really slow, even though in real life it doesn't seem like people fall slow. But in a video game, it feels like they're jumping through jello. So like that was something increasing gravity. And like you look at like Mario jumps and you'll notice there's like a lot of consistency with like, hey, he's in the air for like 0.98 seconds or I can't remember what the metric was, but um, we did a lot of dissecting existing games to say, OK, how do we make it feel good when they jump? How do we make it feel good when he's moving around? Um, we did like wall run and ledge grab and all that kind of stuff. So for us, it was all new, like we'd never done anything like that. So it was a lot of just trying stuff out, looking at other games, all sitting around going, that sucks, oh, that feels good, and uh, just sort of iterating on the base movement mechanics for the game. It, it's so funny that we didn't really have like poly budgets or anything. It was just like, oh, that's too much, or that's not enough, that doesn't look good. We, we really hadn't done a project on our own before, so it was like kind of, uh, especially not next gen because at that time it was like you know what is next gen how are we going to make this game look like gears of war or whatever um and so you know we were we were just like learning stuff as as we went so it was a lot of like trial and error and the first one that we actually showed people um was ryan had made like a blue room level and it was this clock tower so it was just like you were in this room with all this machinery and then I think you like went through and went into a subway or something weird. <laughs> you went into a subway and then it summered with some pistons. It made no sense, but it demonstrated all the different traversal. Like he could glide, he could run on walls. So you like you wall run into a piston, then it pushed you up, and then you like jump up onto a gear and ledge grab onto the gear and let you carry across and pull up and go around. And 
Um, but anyway, it showed off all the traversal mechanics. It, we had some basic combat, but it was just like, shht, shht, shht. like I wouldn't say we mastered combat at that point, but I think that um, when we started showing the game to people, the, the biggest reaction we got was like, wow, this actually feels pretty good. Like very few people can do the, the traversal mechanics like this and make it feel good. And you know that got us a lot of attention, a lot of notice early on when we were shopping around the idea of trying to get funding. I mean, the very first steps were just centered around the playable uh, prototype. I mean, we all worked for free, and then uh, you know, Dave and I kicked in some some cash to help like get the prototype done. Um, but we didn't have there was like no Kickstarter or anything like that back then. So we just kind of relied on friends and you know people that were excited to like come on if if we got funded. You know, they were just like do stuff for free just to like help us out. We went to E3 and we just dragged a, a PC around from publisher to publisher. Anyone who would listen to us, we, we, we went there with a playable prototype. First of all, we were lugging around. We built like a mini computer. I built a mini computer. It was like this big, which is not very mini because um, a laptop couldn't run it very well at the time. And like we actually had a monitor and everything. Like it was terrible. We were hauling it all around in like a giant suitcase. At some point the monitor broke. It was just, it was a disaster. And funny enough, THQ was our last meeting of the day. We'd met with everybody else. We got a few like, eh, we got a few like, get out of here, you suck. <laughs> um, and we're like, THQ, they're not gonna publish our game. What do they make, like SpongeBob games? Like there's no way they're gonna publish this game. But what the heck, we got a meeting with them. It was the last meeting we had at E3. We didn't want to go to it. We knew that all they did was license stuff, license crap. They weren't gonna be interested in us. We were already running late, and we were like, maybe we just shouldn't go. And we seri I think we seriously considered not going, but we made ourselves anyway, just, just to do our due diligence, just to cover all our bases, we went, knowing they'd have no interest. And when we walked in, the guy, Tim Campbell, who saw us, he showed up late, he was pissed off that we were late, had no interest in the pitch, couldn't pot, he, it, was, he was, it was their last meeting also. So you could tell he wanted nothing more than for that E3 to be over. Um, and that's the way the meeting went. You know, I don't think he looked up from the table to acknowledge us until we said we had a playable demo. But when we set the monitor up and we put the controller in his hands, it was an interesting transformation where he went from, like I said, he just wanted to go home to, you know, kind of posture change, he sat up, he got excited. And I think we knew we were onto something when he got up and left the room to bring more people in, right? It's like, hold on, other people got to see this. And he brought people in. And at that point, we were like, I think our first shock was, is THQ really interested in doing new IP? Because they didn't do that then. Little did we know that it was, you know, right place, right time, because they had already made that decision that they needed to stop focusing exclusively on licensed content and kids' content. And they needed their own IP, so we got kind of lucky there. And so apparently he was pretty impressed with it and they contacted us, contacted us after E3 and it wasn't right away. Like this stuff takes a while. I mean, it was a while. I can't remember long. It probably wasn't until the, I don't think it was until the fall of the next year that we really got to the point where like we were solidifying a deal. But um, yeah, they liked it and the rest was history, I guess. We didn't really have like a strong bullet list of like, here's the cool features in the game. And I think like nowadays you would definitely have to have like a strong feature list of what how this game's gonna be different. And, and I think our big differentiator was like, you're one of the forest from the apocalypse, that's cool, right? We like look around the room and expect everybody to nod their head yes. Um, but I think that um, one thing we did wanna do, and this, is, this kind of probably came later, I don't think we pitched this, was that we wanted to combine that sort of like exploration and platforminess of uh, a game like Ratchet and Clank or like Zelda with the more like serious combat of a game like Devil May Cry. Because at the time it was like, hey, if it's a combat game, it's a combat game. Like it's just super, super combos, knocking enemies up in the air and going from like arena to arena and fighting and fighting and fighting. So that combination of those two elements was probably where it ended up. But I don't think we started with that pitch. <laughs> Once THQ picked it up, it was like, oh God, you know, we started ramping up the team and, you know, like, fleshing out like the story and the world um, what what where would it take place like what areas of the city would be affected by the demons and how um, and so a lot of it just happened over time but meanwhile I would just be trying to keep uh, like artists busy like the environment artists and character artists and stuff and luckily we started small and so 
it like kind of grew over time. There was definitely a lot of back and forth in the beginning between, hey, like how do we make it look exactly like a Joe Mad comic book, right? And I think that it was interesting because at the time, you know, because of the technology, graphics technology, it was very important that games look really, had a lot of detail and added like really sophisticated lighting and stuff like that. I think like the, the biggest thing with trying to adapt Joe Mad's art style was trying to figure out what that meant for buildings. I mean, he's he said this himself, like on the project, he's like, man, I don't, I don't really draw buildings much. So it was definitely like a challenge of like, well, what does the world look like? We, we, we can get a Joe Mad character um, and, and make it look really cool and, and make it look like the concept. Um, it was definitely difficult to figure out what that meant. Like, how do you translate? I mean, Joe Mad is a character artist. Like, all, like it's, his characters are amazing. He would do paint overs and he would do like um, quick concepts of stuff. And I think we finally kind of hit a, a pretty good point. Um, even looking back on it now, it's like, oh, there's things I wish we could have done. Um, but it's, it really comes into the play of like, I think where we finally hit it was figuring out, okay, this is the post-apocalyptic. This isn't human uh, apocalypse. This is demons and angels. This is biblical level destruction. Like, what does that look like? Because even at the time when Dark Souls was coming out, there's a couple other post-apocalyptic games. We're like, okay, what sets us apart? Like, it's these giant demon horns bursting through buildings. It's these weird chains that are strung up across, like, just nonsensical, like, cool kind of heavy metal. <laughs> it's, it's something we throw around, like, you know, what's that, what's that mean? Chain spikes and skulls, um, kind of like, how do we, how do we, bring that style into it. And that's, that's the, that was probably the biggest challenge was getting the environments to feel on par with the characters. If we'd have done a really hyper stylized game at that time, I don't think it would have been, it certainly wouldn't have been received internally at THQ as well. Like, I don't know how it would have been received by the fan base, who knows. But I think again, at the time you're looking at games like Gears of War were starting to come out when you see all these fancy normats and dynamic lighting. And so we had a lot of trouble sort of straddling the line between, okay, we want it to look fantasized, so that it has like a lot of the character of a comic book, but we also want to have a lot of those bells and whistles of like more modern games. So, I mean, I don't know what, how well we settled on that. Like, I think we probably could have done better in retrospect, but again, it was our first console game. I think we did pretty good considering. There were like a half a dozen wars. Like we even showed it after we got acquired by THQ, THQ showed it at E3 and war looked completely different. He looked like Robocop, like super robotic um, armor. So that's obviously a big departure where we ended up. But there was even a version of War before that that looked like more like a traditional knight with like blue armor. And then even art style wise, like we went through several different versions, like from more cartoony to like, we got to that point where it was still stylized, but it had some realism to it as far as like materials and textures and surfaces. And so it was definitely a, a long bumpy road to get to that point. Just over time as we were developing it, it just didn't feel, it felt like fantasy was the right way to go with it. And so I started to like, push it back toward that kind of stuff. Because if he's fighting angels and demons and he's this ancient being, maybe he should have like trophies on him and hence all the faces all over his armor and all the, I wanted the pieces of armor to look important. Like maybe he got them like over time from different conquests or whatever. And again, this happened over months or maybe even over a year. It wasn't like an immediate vision that I had where I was like, oh, it's gonna look like this. No way, we, we uh, it definitely evolved over time. and. We, you know, as we brought concept artists onto the team, like they all contributed to the look of it. I always feel like kind of guilty that every, everyone's like, Joe did everything in the uh, Art of Darksiders books. It's so great. And it's like, eh, maybe you should look at the, the credits in there. There's a lot of artists that contributed to the, the look of the game overall. It took a while for us to figure out what it really meant to make a Darksiders dungeon. We had to go through a lot of very difficult iteration before we were happy with the structure of a dungeon, like what it really meant for there to be sort of a core conceit at the center of a dungeon and then rooms that uh, contributed to the completion of whatever the meta goal for the dungeon was and how many exits are there in a room and what's the frequency of combat and what's the difficulty of a puzzle, just actually building the puzzle mechanics so that they function in the game and then escalate from the first room of the dungeon down to the last room of the dungeon, that ended up drastically affecting the structure of the world, the scope of the world, the number of dungeons, how we handled the overworld. Uh, we would put in paths to the dungeon and then go, actually, we feel like we need to slow the player down here. Or we need to speed things up for the player a little bit. There was this 
for probably the first, we worked on the game for about three and a half years, and for the first maybe two years, that was changing often and rapidly. It was definitely hard because for that type of game, like obviously you have open world games like a GTA or like a, like a racing game, but I think one of the hard things about Darksiders or even games like that is that in those games there's large tracts of land where you don't really have to have anything interest. They're meant to be driven by or run through or pass through. But we tried to make a world where like, hey, every little nook and cranny of this world matters, right? Like, hey, there's a giant lake with buildings sticking out because this part of the city sunk into the water. Well, you can actually swim down there and there's cool stuff there. Or there's a graveyard. Well, it can't just be a graveyard. Of course, there's got to be like a gravestone you can push to find <laughs> open a secret entrance. And so trying to build a world that expansive with that much, those many nooks and crannies was pretty challenging. And it was definitely hard to get all that to like load and stream into memory, which we spent a ton of time on, especially in the old console generations. It took us a long time actually to get our, to get our footing on, on Darksiders where we were trying to figure out like scale the world, speed of, of war moving through it, um, you know, what, what his abilities are. Some of the stuff was just obvious like right away it's like okay he's gonna have this and this but then a lot of times it was like well what's what's this gonna be or what, what's this gonna be and how this how these abilities interact with these abilities um so it took us a long time and i think um it wasn't until we actually i can't remember specifically which demo it was or which major deadline it was but we finally got to the point where we got the, uh, the twilight cathedral finished um and that was like a moment of revelation where we just this is it this is darksiders we know what we're making now, finally, after after these years of kind of grinding it out, trying to figure out like what feels right. I think we're all in agreement that we knew what Darksiders would be when we finished the Twilight Cathedral, which would be the first dungeon in Darksiders. That was where we, as a group, probably had the greatest challenge, agreeing on, not necessarily agreeing, but just figuring out what was fun. The combat always kind of felt good, and the art always looked good, but that total you know, cohesion of all the gameplay elements together, puzzles, combat, escalation of both of those things, the structure of the world, the readability of the gameplay space. It wasn't until we finished the Twilight Cathedral, and I, I can remember the run through. Dave was driving, and we played through it. And we, play, we still, I can't, and someone was there taking notes. I hate to not mention them, because they were there really late with me, and I feel bad. And we played till like, I don't remember, middle of the night, and we are just like, that was pretty cool. And it had the cutscenes in there, had all the polish, all the sound, and it was like, that's actually really cool. And, uh, and it's funny, like, again, because this is a new type of game, a new project, a new IP, like, it was hard to explain to the team exactly what we were trying to build all the time. And I think once we got to that point, and it sounds silly, of course, when the game's done, you feel good, but <laughs> there is that moment where it all comes together and people started playing it and they're going, wow, we made a really cool game. And like, everybody's kind of come out of a haze going, wait, this is actually pretty cool. And I think that was that was a really cool. Just sitting in that room with Hayden and whoever was taking notes, sorry. You'll probably remember when you see this, but. We put the controller down and went, that was fun. That was it. Like, this is this is Darksiders. And then we had some, you know, there was some uh, connective tissue we had to put in in some of the city areas that, you know, got you from one dungeon to the next and would, facil would facilitate the story and the storytelling and those story moments. But once we nailed the first dungeon, that actually was important for the team because then we went, we're making a pretty cool game. And this is the thing, when someone plays a game, they're not gonna look at it and go, hey man, you have you have traversal, you got cool combat, you got these awesome dungeons with puzzles and this big open world. They're not gonna look at that and go, hey, look at all this cool stuff. Like, I'm okay with the combat's not as good as Devil May Cry or this is not, because the reality is that's not the case. They still look at the combat and go, all right, I want the combat to be as good as Devil May Cry. And I want the platform to be as good as Mario. And I want the level design to be good as Zelda. <laughs> and I want the cool open world to look as good as whatever the latest and greatest looking game is at the time. So I think from us, A, we were a new studio. We had to build a whole new team. And we had to build a type of game we'd never built before and try to do all those elements well, knowing full well that no one would give you a pass if you didn't do one of them well. And that was definitely by far the most, it, like no one would ever choose to make a game like that with that many disparate stuff. Um, you would build up to that after a couple of sequels, right? You'd make like the simpler version and then you'd add a few elements in the sequel and then be like the third version, you'd build a game like that. We just kind of went all in. We're like, we're just gonna do it all. Possi mostly because we weren't smart enough to realize that that was done at the time. <laughs> uh, and also just because that was the kind of game we wanted to make and we were pretty hell bent on doing it. And that was by far the biggest challenge, trying to just build a game with all those different elements to a level of quality where people would find them acceptable and to enjoy it. Since the dawn of time, the armies of heaven and hell 
have waged an endless war. The original story for Darksiders 1 went through so many iterations that it became this mess. There was like, and that we brought Joe Kelly on at some point, and I don't know how he did it, but he kind of like just pulled out like stuff that was good and got rid of the trash and like filled in all the gaps and made this like cohesive story. And there were things we need to keep for gameplay reasons and it's like, well, why are we doing this? And it's like, that has to be there because at this point in the game you need this ability and you get it from this guy. And you know, so a lot of that stuff drives the story. I think, you know, there are definitely games where the story drives everything, you know, like, like Last of Us or whatever. Uncharted. It's like a it's like a very tight narrative. It's like a film. But our game, you know, because there it is a little more gameplay driven, it was like we need to get like five keys to get through this thing. And it's like, what if like their hearts that this demon eats instead of keys, because keys are not cool. You know, stuff like that. And it's like, who's Samael? He wants the hearts. Why does he want them? You write down a ton of stuff and then half of it gets cut and then you make a bunch of changes and then the game develops to a certain point and you need to like cut some more stuff or change the order in which things happen. And so it, it you know, in my experience, the games we've worked on, it's always been like working each thing to a certain point and then making sure that everything still works together. And if it doesn't, you just kind of have to change it on the fly. I think that part of the reason we were able to make the game as good as we did is that like there we didn't hesitate from doing massive things. Everybody, no one liked it. Everybody got mad and angry and, you know, at first. Because, you know, when you work on something for three, four months and someone comes in and says, you know what, we're not using that, we're going to start over, it can be a little disheartening. Like, even the most stalwart and professional person is going to be like, man, that sucks. <laughs> but I think ultimately people saw by the end, they're like, oh, that made sense. Like, we, I'm sure we made some bad decisions and did some things that probably didn't need to be done. But I think we did a lot of good stuff and we made a lot of bold decisions that let it become the game that it was. Yeah, we ended up cutting a lot um, at different points in the game. Like early on, uh, we were supposed to have the Well of Souls was in, was a whole portion of um, Darksiders 1. We even started like look development of it. We had some key assets and, and a boss plan for it. Um, that just, we cut that pretty early on. Um, one of the earliest demos, even before my time, um, which took like war through, he was riding ruin through the subway and he ends up fighting the character called the Hollow Lord at the end of it. And everybody just loved that model. It's like this big dragon, lava dragon um, character. And for the longest time, we tried to find ways to like, let's get him back in, let's get him back in. And there was a point where he was actually almost on the flight sequence um, that takes you from the city to the church. Um, but we just couldn't make that work and he got cut. Um, but if people remember, there was a GameStop exclusive um, unlock of a version of the scythe he could, that War could use and the code to unlock it was called, it was the Hollow Lord, and that's where that comes from. Um, so he, he's in the game a little bit. You know, I think there was an interesting interplay between the art and the design on Darksiders 1. Some things were definitely driven by art. A lot of the creature design, it was very common for us to design a creature or a boss to have the concept done before we had the design done. And we'd go, like with Tia Matt, I'm pretty sure she was a concept first, where Joe goes, what if we just had this awesome, wicked bat thing with her jugs hanging out, flopping around in the rain? And we're like, damn, that looks awesome. What can we do? And so we, we would design gameplay around the concept. That did happen with creatures quite a bit. Um, in terms of the gameplay, I'd say it was probably a more normal pattern of concept something in Blue Room first or a prototype and then put the art on top of it. As a level designer, I'll say it's always easier if you to, to make compelling design, especially design that has some context, if you have some sort of concept first, if you have concept art first, you, it's gonna give you ideas. I just try to keep it in that fantasy horror but not too horror vein where it really still felt like a, you know a fantasy game. Our influences were definitely pulled from you know like games like Diablo and uh, later like Blizzard stuff, you know Warcraft or whatever. It's not it's not very hard to like see where our influences came from. Uh, but you know, we always try to keep like a fresh spin on it. And for me, like coming from comics, I always try to tweak my style slightly for whatever project I'm doing. You know, if it's like a Spider-Man story, it'll be a little more comical and fun. 
uh, if it's Wolverine, I'll go a little darker. And so for Darksiders, it was definitely at the, the darkest range of where my style goes. You know, like um, creatures like the Jailer, they're all like these mutated, grotesque guys with cages filled with bodies hanging off them. It's not stuff that I typically draw for fun. You know what I mean? So it, it, it was for me like just knowing like what the game needed and pushing it in that direction. But I never let it get too dark. I think that's what people react to. You know, even some of the demons are funny, like Vulgrim, the, the dialogue, uh, the watcher, you know, keeps things kind of light. Um, so it has like a really nice uh, flow to it. Here's the thing is when you start a new IP or a new game, like you very rarely go into knowing exactly what you're going to make. You have a basic idea, and the, but the game kind of makes itself over time. And I, I don't remember who said it, but someone made the perfect analogy. Like building a game is like trying to cross an ocean while you're building a boat. Like you just go with a couple planks of wood and you're like, we'll build the boat on the way across. And that's kind of what it's like building a game, especially a new IP. And I think that like all those factors kind of contribute to the fact that, yeah, you're going to make mistakes, you're going to have to redo stuff. And ultimately, if you're committed to the fact that you want this game to be as good as possible, you put in the effort to try to make it as good as possible. And you know, we were young and inexperienced, and you can mitigate all that by with experience. But at the time, that's just what it took, and it is what it is. I think the development of Darksiders One is a, a cautionary tale. <laughs> um, we were a, a young new studio. We were trying to make something that's not easy, which is a, a Zelda-esque slash God of War-esque Dante or a Devil May Cry type of game. Um, and for a studio that didn't have any kind of pedigree, that was a challenge trying to get to that point. Um, and unfortunately, because of that, we ended up crunching really heavily um, for the last year of that project. Like I, even years afterwards, I'd run into old colleagues and friends and they'd be like, whew, heard about that Darksiders crunch, man. Sorry to hear that. I'm like, oh, wow, that's bad. <laughs> People at other companies are, are, you know, that I didn't tell them, but they, they're like, oh, man, that sounds bad. So it was, it was definitely bad. It, it really hurt the team, I think, um, in, in the long run. And, you know, it, it was definitely, for me, it was worth it just because of, it's one of my proudest accomplishments in, in game development is getting Darksiders 1 out there. When I went to Vigil, I was the UI, they hired me as the UI artist for Darksiders. And uh, when I started, um, there was like no UI in the game at all. And they were like, Alpha's in a month. And I was like, oh, crap, you know. <laughs> so uh, me and a programmer just buckled down and we got it done and with no sleep or just crunching for months. The crunch on Darksiders 1 was something I don't ever really want to repeat. Now I look back on it certainly with some fond memories because it was, it was a bit like going to war and winning the war. I think that's what it had felt like. If we had shipped a game that didn't do well or flopped or uh, wasn't something that everybody as a group was collectively proud of, it might have felt like going to war and losing and the complete opposite feeling. Um, and I th that's always what kept us going was even in the, the darkest, busiest, dreary-eyed hour was okay, it's gonna be a good game, we just gotta get it out the door. And everybody felt pretty passionate. At least we felt, even for the people who maybe weren't really happy with the process, they were at least, they enjoyed their coworkers enough or they enjoyed the game enough, some part of it enough that when they came to work they were pros about it. At least in terms of the final output of the work. And yeah, I think that could have fractured the team and it could have blown up had we shipped the game. Um, and it didn't do well, or it wasn't received well. But because it was, and everybody always believed we would be at that point, uh, the crunch actually did bond the team. There's a funny story about the bosses in Darksiders 1, because a lot of them were, I don't remember, at this point it's hard to remember who really did what on, on Darksiders 1, but I know a lot of the bosses were done by Dave and Steve Matarera, who is the animation director and, and lead designer here at Airship, worked directly with Dave on a lot of the bosses in Darksiders 1, and they called themselves Team Boss, and I was like always jokingly the fifth Beatle, trying to insert myself into Team Boss and, and get my ideas in, and when, when they weren't listening, I would try to sow dissent between them, and uh, you know, tongue in cheek of course, but always trying to fracture Team Boss and, and get the two mad at each other. I had a, a lot of involvement working close with Dave and 
uh, making the bosses fun. I mean, bosses are always just a lot of fun to work on. They're uh, way more unique than the typical creature. And uh, yeah, it was cool having tons of bosses. I remember uh, some things like with uh, the Straga, uh, the Straga fight in the first scene. Um, we were trying to like figure out like something to make him like stand out and something cool he can do. And we were just joking around, and I was like, he can like pick up the street and slam it down. I said it like half as a joke, and then Dave, being as crazy as he is, was like, all right, yeah, let's do it. And then we did it, and he picks up the street and slams it because he's a giant uh, creature and it was turned out pretty cool. Dave's a little crazy about everything. Dave is one of the most manic game developers, at least in terms of his attention to detail and um, the passion he puts into the into into his work. I mean, nobody put more work into Darksiders 1 or 2 than Dave. I mean, he was, yeah, that's sort of his identity as a game developer. But I will say that before he worked on worked on his first boss, I already knew that was his personality as a developer. So to find out that he would, you know, get that into boss design was no no surprise. <laughs> I was literally working from the second I got into the office <laughs> till very late at night every single day. I was like obsessed on that game. I barely remember anything else that happened to be honest with you. I, like the rest of us, I don't think Dave really knows to be any different. He's just a game developer that in a way, because he, when Vigil started, he was the only one that had any experience at all doing anything like running a game studio, so he became the de facto GM and never really lost the core, which was that he was in it to make video games. So that's what always, like, anybody could have walk up to Dave and talk to him about working on the game. Wait a minute, Clint, aren't you supposed to like battle back with a like dueling banjos, you're supposed to duel back, aren't you? We we became pretty big toward the end, but it 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 always felt like a pretty tight knit group of people. It started small, we had fun, we pranked each other. We didn't really ever get to the point where it just felt for the team of our size, like it didn't feel you know, corporate and just oppressive. It was, it was still pretty fun. And you know, like it always gets tough like in certain parts of, of game development, but we always, um, I think because what we were making was so cool, everyone was so excited to be working on it and, and see Darksiders come out. Um, we all, pretty much everyone was just committed to making the game awesome. And so it, it really, uh, carried us I think yeah I mean I like it's funny as some of my memories are again are like just a, and again not to condone crunching but like some of my favorite memories are like just the late night craziness that would go on where everybody's like ranting and raving each other trying to get stuff in I'd be in a terrible mood I'd be like throwing controllers on the ground because stuff sucked um, but like you still joked around you still had funs so, like we were all really good friends and that was the cool part I think at the end of the day that and it's funny at the time it's like you become such close friends with these people that you work with every day and you can't imagine not ever not working with them. Even though there's a lot of them I don't work with anymore now, but at the time I could have never imagined like they were they were just like they were my clan, and we were doing cool stuff, and that was it was a really good feeling. The first review we got, official review we got back, was Play Magazine's 10 out of 10, which set a pretty high expectation for us. We had really high standards for ourselves even though it was still just our first game. So I, to this day, I don't know if we're necessarily totally satisfied with, if we're speaking just about the critical reception, you know, like the Metacritic that people fixate on. Um, 82 to 85, that's pretty good though. You know, I mean now, I think <laughs> as we've gotten removed from the reviews and can look at that score a little bit, put it more in context with the industry uh, as a whole, it's something I think for to be proud of because it's pretty hard to get those numbers. You literally have no idea how it's going to receive. I mean, you think it's pretty cool, and THQ did all this, like, they do these, like, mock reviews where, like, ex-journalists uh, play the game and give you a mock review. So you have, like, some notion of roughly where it's going to land, although one of those mock reviews was really, really bad. Um, but that's because they got a non-complete version of the game. And they claim in their, in their advertising pitch that they can evaluate a game knowing it's not done, but I don't think that's actually true. But anyway... Um, they gave us a really bad mock review, and we're like, mm, I just didn't. and we'd fixed a bunch of stuff since then. So there's a little bit of like trepidation, obviously, but uh, fortunately it turned out pretty good. 
We always were just as excited or more excited by the general fan response. And I think the fact that now we're still talking about Darksiders and that even after DS1 and DS2 came out, years later, the, the, the story of Airship and the story of Gunfire was compelling largely because we were ex-Darksiders developers. And if Darksiders, regardless of the Metacritic, hadn't been received by people the way it was players, uh, I don't think our studios would be as successful as they are right now or have the interest that they do. And I think that's a testament to, we did something right because the games just have staying power. They have longevity. People really cared about them. So obviously the reviews and the fact that they were largely positive is awesome. It's, it's something we're extremely proud of. But we were just as or more excited about what seemed to be the general response from players. I think that it's like making a game is like playing Dark Souls, like and fighting a boss in Dark Souls, right? You get your ass kicked like 20 times, and then you finally kill the boss on the 21st time, and you're high-fiving. Even though the 20 times before that, you're like, this game sucks, I hate this game. You're like punching holes in walls and shit. But when you finally actually do it, like everybody's super happy. And making a game is just like that. You go to like 20 meetings, everybody's depressed because stuff sucks or broken or doesn't look good. And then you go to that one meeting where it all comes together and the cutscenes there and you're like, wow, that was really fucking cool. And you're all high five. And, and I think that's really, those moments are really what make the rest of the moments worth it. It was pretty much uh, a foregone conclusion that we would just do another Darksiders game. If we were considering something else, I don't remember right, uh, right now. I, I'm pretty sure it, it was just, all right, what's Darksiders 2 going to be? Um, everyone at THQ is pretty happy with how Darksiders turned out. Um, and so we were already like kind of thinking about a sequel as we were wrapping the first game. Yeah, after one, we were like all set to work on Darksiders 2. Like, we knew pretty early on we wanted it to be death, which is insane in and of itself. Like, if you make God of War 2, of course Kratos is your main character. You make Devil May Cry 2, of course Dante is your main character. It's just the idea of switching characters with a complete new moveset, completely new abilities is already madness in and of itself. And then, and then to say, you know what, we're going to add all these RPG elements. We're going to have random loot and all this kind of straight stuff and leveling up. And again, this goes back to the fact that we were kind of dumb in a good way, like we were dumb in the like ambitious, crazy way. Um, and so that was number one. That was the first thing. And we, we pretty much knew that from the beginning. Um, but we thought we were going to just ace us out of park. Like we just made one. We know everything there is about console games. We got this, right? No. When we switched from war to death, I think we felt like it was kind of important for us to do that, both to keep the player off balance and you know something kind of cool with the announcement, right? Because we knew we weren't going to go to the four player like we wanted to, but doing another horseman was kind of a big an interesting escalation. And that changed a lot about the player's combat package, but it wasn't necessarily, a, it didn't really wipe the slate clean completely. Our hope was that, you know, because we didn't get to do all four horsemen playable in the first one, maybe we could do that in the sequel. Um, you know, whether it was us or THQ or both of us agreeing, maybe we still weren't ready to to do something that ambitious. Uh, I think we all felt like at least showing a new horseman like one of the other guys might be almost as cool. And I think it was one of those things when we threw it out there, everyone was like immediately excited about it. It's like, yeah, you know, even though it's probably not an efficient way to develop stuff, because you kind of want to capitalize on all the stuff you've built. So we've spent years building the moveset for this character. And then rather than just build on it, we just, did a new character. Um, but then, you know, I, I think the design called for a lot more traversal and it felt like war was like this sort of like warrior tank slow guy. And then this like light, quick, you know, agile sort of assassin guy would be, would just feel different. It would be, and then so, and actually I, thinking back on it now, during the whole development of Darksiders 1, when, when we would do interviews and press stuff, they would always ask, why did you pick war? Like out of all the horsemen, like death is like the most well-known one. And we're like, I don't know, it just seemed cool to start with the uh, sort of like warrior archetype. And so I think it was always kind of in the back of our minds to, to that death would be the next one if, if we ever did it, just because it came up so often in, in conversation. Um, and so, and then I just like started doing a few drawings of them with the bone mask and the scythes and 
we all just were like, yeah, this feels cool, let's do that. The game was way bigger than Darksiders 1. I mean, if, if I could go back in time, I would have made Darksiders 2 about the same size as Darksiders 1 and just like added more polish and more depth to what was there as opposed to trying to expand it. Like we had four different unique zones and like, I think we had five we had five or six dungeons in Darksiders 1. We had like 20 in Darksiders 2. And I mean, I did most of the bosses on Darksiders 2. I think I did like 20 bosses. Like first of all, what game has 20 bosses? Except for maybe a Dark Souls game. But Dark Souls also doesn't have puzzles and dungeons and all that other crazy stuff we had in there. Yeah, the bosses are super interesting because the, yeah, the bigger you make them, the, the more you have to account for in the combat space. Like like Straga was a huge boss in Darksiders 1, whereas most of the bosses, the other bosses were um, like Tiamat or um, Stygian uh, or um, the Griever. They're all, they're big, but they're not ginormous where the, there was a lot of huge ones. There was the Guardian and um, giant squid guy from Darksiders 2, I can't remember his name. Um, but yeah, those definitely, those, you have to account for a lot more in those spaces where it's like, it's much bigger. He, the moves have to be visible to the player at all times so they know what's going on with this giant creature that's looming above them. Otherwise, it, it's not a fun fight if you can't really see what, what they're gonna do um, at any moment. So there's, there's definitely a lot that goes into like setting up those spaces to feel right for the gameplay. It was just more and more and more, which was cool. It was fun because, I mean, at the end of the day, like Darksiders for me personally, is a game about exploration. I know you're one of the forest from the apocalypse, and some people look at as look at Darksiders as a game about killing stuff and being a badass. But for me, it's always been exploration. Like, you know, I always joked on Darksiders one when I was playing through levels. I'm like, hey, where's my secret level? I want to like go into a room, slide a barrel out of the way, and fall into a secret level because that's cool and I like to discover things. We never actually did it, but <laughs> and I, there was some secret levels in Darksiders too. But that idea, of this cool world with all these endless possibilities, the idea that you could look behind anything, look under any crack, any crevice, and you'd find something cool and interesting was, for me, the number one goal for the Darksiders franchise. And that's why we just try to add more and more and more to Darksiders too. The team was just working really well together on the tail end of Darksiders 1. We had figured out like a lot of like pipeline issues and just um, run into enough development nightmares that we didn't want to repeat the same mistakes. And our team was just better. You know, we had more people, they were more experienced. Um, and so we just kind of hit the target faster, you know, each time. So it kind of made us feel bold that, you know, we can do all new traversal modes and all this new stuff, random loot, whatever. And just, you know, because we've gotten so good at the other stuff, of course, you know, that's crazy, but um, it just sounded good at the time. Mm -hmm. Uh, and like, you know, it was a lot of work, but I think everyone was uh, excited about the, the, the change. And I think fans, it was like very well received. So I can't even imagine what Darksiders 2 would have been like if it was war again. You know, um, I think it was just right. It felt right for us. It felt right to the fans and, you know, THQ supported it. So, you know, at that time, it's, it was their money. So we had their blessing. That's cool. When, you, when you're doing stuff for yourself, you're a lot more judicious about, you know, where where everything goes. But, you know, we were getting our, you know, bills paid and they were excited about what we were doing. So we're like, cool, let's just do this. The biggest change was how the world felt going from one dungeon to the next, trying to give uh, the outdoor space a real overworld feel. And that was probably the most challenging iteration factor from Darksiders 1 to Darksiders 2 was, um, figuring out exactly how we wanted the world to behave, you know, because we wanted we wanted it to feel a little bit more, uh, we wanted a little more freeform exploration in Darksiders 2. And in some ways, I don't know if it necessarily was to the game's benefit. That's one thing where we were like, eh, maybe the Darksiders 1 formula actually worked a little bit better in this particular case. But otherwise, yeah, we, we relied on a lot of the same game design choices we had made in Darksiders 1 when doing Darksiders 2. So it really wasn't going too far back. Technically it was, because we had to implement death from the ground up. And we might have done that with war anyway, just <clears throat> because we had more experience and he might have been a, you know, technically cleaner to start him from the beginning also, but really a lot of the ideas were the same. I think we just got better all around. Like literally every mechanic was better. And it's funny because I got about the same review scores. And I think that some of that has to do with just as the game industry matures, it gets harder and harder to, to, to make a really high quality game. 
but so even though everything like the art was objectively better across the board, the traversal was way better, the combat was be way better. There were some things I actually liked better in Dark Siders One. I liked the smaller, more focused world. Um, but uh, yeah, we got a lot better at everything we did, and that's honestly what allowed us to add so much more stuff. I mean, the fact that we could produce that much more content at a higher level of quality was a testament to the fact that we had learned a lot and gotten a lot better at what we were doing. Uh, Darksiders 2, in some ways, was much smoother, but in other ways, it had its own set of issues. Um, again, creating a much bigger world meant we needed better streaming tech. Um, we had to deal with um, the same limitations because it was built for. We we're, were basically trying to build a bigger game, which we struggled with on Darksiders 1, making a, a fully streaming game on the last-gen consoles. Um, and then we came at Darksiders 2 and tried to make it a bigger game <laughs> with the same limitations. Um, so it meant, from a technical standpoint, we had to do a lot of updates to our engine. Um, a big thing we added was terrain, um, because that was like one of the only ways to manage these large open spaces that you could ride, um, ride the horse around in. So it, it definitely made it, um, there's a lot of stuff that went into that. Um, and then everything about it was like a bigger game, so it, it, it definitely had a, its own unique challenges by when you start pressing, pushing out the world to be bigger, you just open up all these other problems that you didn't encounter previously. Really, the fact that we developed Darksiders 2 in pretty close to the same time that we developed Darksiders 1, but we made a 40-hour game instead of a 15 to 20-hour game, I think that spoke to what we had figured out about the process. We, we just, we, we knew what we were doing in, in certain regards more than we did on Darksiders 1. So it, got a, it became a lot more efficient. We crunched, we still crunched. And it wasn't necessarily fun, but we crunched a lot less than we did on Darksiders 1, and we made a much bigger game doing it. We had pre-production meetings. We didn't have a lot of pre-production. I think that um, Darksiders 2 more so than 1. Like, 1 was pretty much, we got signed by THQ, and we were just making the game. Like, we're building levels. I don't even think we really knew what the idea of pre-production was at the time, to be honest with you. Darksiders 2, there was a good six months of just, like, messing with mechanics and trying out different ideas and working out some of the story stuff that... It's, it's definitely considered pre-production. Like, I don't know if we had exactly pre-production meetings, but there was a pretty large swath of time where we weren't doing major production on the game that normally would be considered pre-production. I'm actually not exactly sure why. To, in some regard, I think we felt like, okay, the game's gonna be bigger. Maybe we can bring in some resources. Um, I, Danny Bilson takes a particular interest in storytelling and had guys that he brought on staff that THQ felt like you know they were there specifically to help develop story in the games. And Darksiders 2's story, at least in terms of the amount of narrative content, was much bigger than Darksiders 1 because we had NPCs and the NPCs had branching dialogue trees and there was much more spoken dialogue between, between the characters which put more emphasis on actually sitting down and taking time to write dialogue. So, you know, it kind of made sense that they, that they took on more of that burden and, and you know, we focus more on more on the gameplay. One idea we had for Darksiders 2 from the beginning was that more of it would take place off of Earth because we were just kind of tired about how much stuff can you do in like subways and streets and you know hollowed out buildings. Like it, it we felt like we needed to like sort of move off of Earth, and so Death would be going to like these other realms and stuff like that. And and so um, I, you know, I, I think on two I was just more. By then I was like very like. I wasn't doing a lot of concept art and stuff anymore, except for Death and some of the main story characters. Uh, the world team was pretty awesome and self-sufficient. I would just step in on a very high level and be like, I don't think this feels right for this area. Maybe the makers should have more nature stuff and like giant trees and whatever. Uh, you know, here's what their architecture might look like. Um, it was a lot more of a, of a like director role. You know, we had an awesome concept team by that point and they were just like churning stuff out. You know, I might give them like a loose direction to go on, you know, they're kind of like dwarves, you know, but they're giants and they have, they're like, they use nature magic and what, whatever would like kind of get the, the concept team like focusing in, in the right direction. Yeah, I think it was really hard for us because just the sheer quantity, because you know, as an example, I think in the first zone, what is like the maker zone, and um, Darksiders 2, and I'm trying to remember because we had all these weird nomenclatures. We had MDs, SDs, and LDs. LD was like a main dungeon. Like the final dungeon in Darksiders 2 where you fought the, the big giant construct at the end, that was the LD, we had one of those. And then we had MD, which were medium-sized dungeons, and I think we had three of those? Three or four? Four. And then we had SD, which were side dungeons, and I think we had two of those. So we had 
four or five, six, seven dungeons in one of the zones. So we already had more dungeons in the first area of Darksiders 2 than in all of Darksiders 1. So A, just planning all it out, planning out the mechanics, like, hey, you're gonna get the gun here, or you're gonna get that weird rolly ball thing here, or you're gonna get the maker's key that lets you ride the big constructs here, and planning out how all those puzzle mechanics built upon each other, um, which ones were featured in which dungeons, and how you used them against the bosses, and all that kind of stuff. That's always tricky, and it's you go through a ton of iterations, and uh, by far, that was just managing all that for all the content in Dark Souls 2 was a big thing to do. And I think there were some of us who felt like if we had just made, done the same things we did in Darksiders 2, but spent more time making a really quality 20 to 25 hour game, it could have been one of those that was like a 90 Metacritic type game. Uh, but you know, we, it, it ended up being a good game regardless, and we're certainly proud of the effort. And uh, I, would hold, I would put the amount of content we created with the team size we had and the resources that we had in terms of like money and, and, and time up against any other studio, because we should, the team should be really proud of having made a game that big in that time frame and on that budget. Darksiders 2, I was asked by Vigil Games um, to come up with some concept ideas and um, that's how it started. They um, were looking for something unusual, but the process with them hadn't really started that much yet. They were, we were still in the initial phases and the, I um, was so inspired by what I saw and what they showed me that I immediately put some stuff together and it, it, it felt like it came together fairly. I felt pretty good about it, um, and um, the team really liked my ideas, and uh, so that's how we started the whole thing. Ryan was a huge fan of Jesper Kid. Um, our audio director was a big fan of him, and I think we, we, we really liked music and video games. Like, that was, there was a lot of passion around that. Like, I remember playing WoW, and we all loved the music in WoW, and, and I can't remember what we, game we had been playing that Jesper Kid had maybe worked, maybe it was Assassin's Creed. I can't remember. Anyway, it was, we were like, wow, this music's amazing. Yeah, so what, what we did is we actually put together uh, a submission process and, uh, you know, reached out to a couple composers and we plugged that, uh, those submissions in to the project and let, uh, you know, audio team and then team at large play through the game and kind of see how it resonated with them. And Jesper's was, it nailed it. Darksiders 1 uh, was very much a classical orchestra, and with Darksiders 2 being more off-world, uh, otherworldly, we wanted them to kind of uh, experiment, you know, come up with, with a, a soundscape and textures, but still rooted with some uh, familiar, familiar instruments. Uh, yeah, he was ideal candidate for that. Uh, he nailed it. I, I, was, I was lucky enough to be sort of involved in the, the process of uh, picking the composers on Darksiders 2 or going through uh, the review of the composers and seeing the audio team's thought process as we, as we and it, it basically boiled down to three really, really awesome composers and everybody got into a room, well, a, a small group of guys got into a room, listened to all the samples, A-B comparison, didn't know names, just cast votes and Jesper was the one that came out on top. I knew his stuff from like way back in the day. He did like this music for this small MMO-ish game called Spellborn. Chronicles of Spellborn, I think it was called. And so, like, I emailed him and I'm like, hey, I've liked your stuff since Chronicles of Spellborn. And he was all, oh, God, that stuff, I can't even believe anyone saw that stuff. But, uh, but yeah, I guess Assassin's Creed is really cool, too. Well, I was, um, you know, looking for a way to, um, you know, find something in what they presented to me. How can I hit on something that they're presenting to me? I mean, that's what we always try to do, right, as composers. They did not want a uh, typical or what you would expect type of score, especially fantasy score. They wanted me to go in a really unique direction. And so they encouraged me to really keep pushing and see how um, far I could push you know, this whole thing. And that's, um, that's, that's really where it started. And um, 
it's you know re remembering and thinking back on it it really you know strikes me they kept telling me you can go further it's okay you know keep going so that's that's one of the best scenarios that I can think of you know working in when you're that encouraged and you come up with something you f you're excited about and then they're like you know we really like this feel free to go further you know so it was a very um, it, was a, it was a great experience first time it was in the game we were like yep that's about it you know because we had heard them we heard them outside the game and loved them and some of the first tracks we sent uh, were so evocative of the gameplay because we'd sent you know the, the Jeremy and the audio guys had sent some pretty detailed uh, write-ups and specs, screenshots, so he was working from some material and he really nailed the essence pretty pretty quickly so when we stuck it in the game, it was like, made the right choice. Well, I wrote that score with a emphasis on the storyline and also Joe Mad's art was so atmospheric, it was so colorful um, and I really connected with that. I think that's something about um, Joe Mad's art that is a, is a really good fit uh, and I get really inspired by it when I look at his art because it is so atmospheric and that's something I always uh, try to work on with my music. The story was, was fantastic. I mean, you, you know, it basically starts with, you know, death and then you go explore the afterlife. That to me was just super interesting. So that, that was one of the main things I, I took that this could be a journey into the afterlife. Um, and so that's what the music really was um, was focusing and honing in on. And as, as as the score was progressing, that's what I kept trying to perfect was that sense of spirituality and and depth. Uh, that you know, you're you're dead and you play as death, but we're not talking about uh, a black hole. You know, we're talking about life after death and uh, and this this grand story and how death actually saves humanity. How can we just score death with this, this dark, evil music when he's the one out there trying to save humanity? We have to put a spin on this, you know? So I started seeing why they were asking for something so different, and I really uh, locked into that and completely understood what it, what it meant to the team, why they wanted something different. Um, and there's so many different realms in the game as well. So you go from, from places like heaven to places like a City of the Dead and Demon World, and I felt you know, this needed a real, very kind of visual, um, atmospheric take on the music. And so I had to dig really deep, I felt, for that. It became a very um, personal score to me. Um, you know, I'm sure some of my own belief system was metal into the score. You know, you can't really write something that becomes personal like that without putting some of your, um, I don't know, for lack of a better word, some of your soul into it, you know. And, and again, that was what's so great about it, that it's not just I wasn't the only one who who had connected with, you know, even though it's a personal score, it seems to have resonated with a lot of people. With Jesper stuff, there's always like it's like orchestrated, but it's, it's like a little industrial or modernized. There's like some like crunchy sounds to it. It doesn't feel, you know, generic. And I think that's what we immediately loved about it. Yeah, working with, with Vigil on Dark Side, as some of my favorite moments is, is, is definitely when um, you get the reaction back from the team on the music you're making. Uh, because I knew that I was, you know, pushing myself and making something that was a bit out there, uh, to say the least, uh, especially for a type of game like this. Uh, and uh, the type of, you know, scenario and location that, that plays in the game. Um, but they really got it and, and, and understood that I was following the storyline uh, very closely, you know, with, with, with these tracks. And uh, so that would be my, my favorite thing is just, you know, the, the support of the team. It's, it's really, um, you know, it was, it was really amazing to, 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 to get that strong support. Yeah, I, you know, I'm, I'm honored that people, uh, you know, like the Dark Side of Music too much. And, and, and I do feel that it's, it's one of my most personal scores. I put a lot of my soul into that score and, and my belief system into that score. And um, I think that's something that um, perhaps it shines through, but more, most, more importantly, if we're talking about my opinion, 
um, it, it felt very good to know that people understood what I was trying to express with it. Like, you know, this is my take on perhaps the afterlife, you know. And, but people got that, you know. They, they understood what I was trying to say with it. And that was what the team understood early on as well. And, and I think why they encouraged me to keep experimenting and keep pushing it. Um, and that's really something that um, surprised me, you know, reviews and, and, and fans alike um, seems to really have, um, you know, some of the things I read surprised me, like, wow, you really got what I was trying to say with that. And, uh, you know, that really is uh, it's very pleasant. You know. No, I'm unbiased. We listen to soundtracks at work all the time. I always have since way back in the day. And I think the Darksiders 2 soundtrack is one of the best overall game soundtracks in maybe like the last decade or something. It's really good. If you haven't listened to it, people need to listen to it because, uh, you know, it's got like a nice mix of really chill, ambient, like atmospheric, moving, sweeping pieces and then some like badass like action, uh, just over the top combat pieces. So Jesper is just, uh, he's amazing. Darksiders 2 definitely felt more like a steady process to me. Like there weren't as many peaks and valleys as there were in Darksiders 1. Like Darksiders 1 had that moment where we had the dungeon and we're like, yes, this is going to be a good game. Darksiders 2, I think, because we had made the game already, even though death was new, we, are, we always had some idea of where the game was going to go. And when it got there, it was more or less what we had predicted. So yeah, it felt very steady. Like it felt like a very steady march. You know, for me, the high points for me were always you know, thinking about the new character, Death, and like how he would play, like how he would be similar to War in the ways that matter and still feel like a horseman. Uh, and, and then like what was different about him, how he would move differently and attack differently. And, and for me, like just like prototyping a lot of the, the gameplay stuff, you know, in my mind or like in loose sketches which were definitely the most exciting. If there were valleys it was just like me sort of like handing the reins over to you know other people like as the team like got much larger um, and then you know whenever you know we'd run through like an area for the first time like the Crow Fathers level and you have all these amazing cinematic cameras and seeing all the new traversal stuff like the, the wall climb and wall run that that death was doing it. It, it, it was like super exciting. I, I felt, I mean, we all worried at the beginning that doing a new character was gonna be risky, but I think once we saw death in action, it was like really inspiring. We expected fans to be excited to play death because really because the promise was the four horsemen. If we had said there are these four awesome characters you're gonna get to play, and then we did two games in a row that were the same character, leaving three off the table, I think actually we felt like if we weren't gonna do four, doing another one would be far more exciting than doing the same one over again. So when fans were excited about it, that was that was what we had expected. Darksiders 2 did feel to us like a confirmation that we had a cool franchise. You know, Darksiders 1, there's always that chance that with your sophomore effort, you know, you're it's gonna be a you're gonna slump or you're not gonna match the quality or um, the expectations set from the first one. And even though it was different in a lot of ways, we added loot, right? Which was a big departure from Darksiders 1's the itemization system in Darksiders 1. Um, and not everybody is gonna like every decision, right? So some people preferred one thing in Darksiders 1 versus another thing in Darksiders 2, but in some total, they, I mean, they both sold about the same, they both were reviewed very similarly. So, you know, apples to apples, they actually were very, they were achieved a similar level of success, which to us felt like, yeah, confirmation that we were doing something right, that people really did care about the franchise. And by that point, honestly, even we at the studio, after seven years of working with Darksiders in two games, we were feeling a little bit of franchise fatigue too. So at the end of Darksiders 2, that was the first time we said, do we want to do another Darksiders game? So we had a loose idea of where uh, the third game would go, but we never really got far enough in developing that idea to where it was, it was still just vague notions. It's like I had some ideas, Dave had some ideas, um, I think we considered the idea like, what if they lost their powers and they were just mortals living on a, in the old west, whatever. That was like like Dave and I'm like, no, they should attack hell and fight Lucifer, you know, like just go all the way, fight the Chard Council. 
Um, and so we, we would like talk about it, but it was still far off enough that we were kind of like, eh, we'll, we'll see what happens like as we you know, finish Darksiders 2, uh, where it's gonna go. And there was already talk at THQ that we might, the, the next game might not be a Darksiders game. We would kind of like pause it and do something else, which was not very appealing to me like on a personal level. So I was, you know, I never got too far into uh, what you know what the story might be for a third game because it, it, we weren't even really sure if that was going to happen or not. It was always in our mind that yes we would return to the franchise soon but we we had moved off and we were not working on a third Darksiders at the time THQ went down and when it finally happened I mean it may have been a shock to the outside world and some of the employees who might not have been privy to all the, the, the details of what was happening at THQ but I think by and large it was all very public that THQ had been on shaky ground for a while. They had, I think in the course of Vigil's lifetime, they shut down something like a dozen studios you know, to help finance games like Darksiders and some of the Warhammer stuff they were doing and their other original IP. But it seemed like stuff might, might have come around. I was kind of under the thought, that like, I think they might actually pull this off. And at the time, we actually weren't working on Darksiders. We were working on a whole new IP because they wanted us to take a break from Darksiders for a while. And, uh, and then they're like, oh, by the way, we're bankrupt. I'm like, whoa, really? Even then it was like, but we got a plan. And I'm like, all right. And the plan sounded plausible. Um, and then that didn't work. And then I was I was actually at the bankruptcy hearing. So I got to see the whole process, which by the way, you can make a whole documentary on bankruptcy hearings. They're pretty fascinating things. <laughs> Probably not many people watch it because they'd fall asleep, but <laughs> um, <laughs> just seeing a company carved up and auctioned off to a bunch of different people was pretty. And at the time I was reading, the final book of the Will of Time, so I had this weird double ending thing, like I was witnessing the end of THQ while reading the end of a series I'd been reading for like 20 something years, so it was kind of a weird surreal thing. At the time, all the, most of the other studios had a game in production, like Saints Row was finishing up, I mean, Volition was finishing up Saints Row 4, I don't know. Um, so everybody had a project pretty far along but we had literally just shipped the game. So I think, you know, when you're looking at, I wanna buy a studio, right? Because at the end of the day, when you buy a studio, you buy the people and whatever they're working on. And so if you take out the whatever they're working on part, you're just buying the people. At that point, you're like, well, I can just hire those people. Why do I buy the studio? And so it sucked and it was disappointing, but I mean, it made sense. The writing had been on the wall for THQ for a little while. I mean, the stock price had, you know, they had done whatever the inverse of a split is in, I don't remember what it's called, but when the stock rejoined like tenfold, I mean, that's a sign that a company's in trouble. And that was months before, you know, the stuff finally hit the fan. So no, nobody was really surprised, even if they were hurt. You know, I had, I had taken on a Marvel contract and like, I, you know, obviously was still having lunch with all my friends there and talking to all my friends. And when they were telling me all the stuff that was going on, my heart was like, sinking you know but I was already kind of just like on the outside looking in and just like hoping for the best for all my my former teammates and friends and uh, so yeah I mean it was definitely heartbreaking um, but I knew like the talent that was there and the, like the stuff that that team was capable of so it seemed crazy to me that they wouldn't just try to find some way to you know keep keep it going or just like double down and like maybe kill some other studios and some other projects and like just pick a couple to like keep going. I don't know, you know, I wasn't really uh, privy to a lot of the, the high level THQ stuff obviously, but uh, you know, I was just like in disbelief, I guess. When Vigil went unpurchased at the auction, I think there was, there was kind of an ego blow, like why would you not want this studio full of awesome talent? But pragmatically, no, it's not. It, we weren't really surprised because what people were there at that auction to buy were bargains. So a lot of the games that did get snapped up were games that were 50% or more done that the buyer could get for pennies on the dollar and they'd only have to be responsible for paying for a small portion of the development while seeing the benefit of all of the, all of the profits from, from the effort. So we didn't have that, right? We were still in pre-production on a new game. And so I think from a business perspective, it's pretty easy to understand why Vigil didn't get acquired, but the Darksiders IP did, because that has ongoing value. You know, Vigil Games, it was it was a big family there. Like, I mean, we had been through the trenches together, we had made multiple products, uh, we felt like we had a, a fan base that enjoyed the titles, and uh, you know, it happens. They, you know, the company, parent company ran out of money, and 
couldn't keep the, the projects going, couldn't keep the team together. Uh, so yeah, we were bummed. Vigil's closing days were, uh, I can't forget it because Vigil actually was officially dead on my 35th birthday. So that was my birthday present. And uh, <clears throat> it was, I, we really didn't even have time to mourn it because that's when, I, I don't remember the exact process, but somehow, you know, guys from Crytek got in touch with Dave. And I remember him stopping me in the hallway and saying, hey, you know Crytek, uh, guys there reached out to me after the auction and they're interested in maybe, I don't know, doing something with the studio or starting a new studio or something. You think we should do it? Yeah, so we were like, I was still at the office and um, there was all kinds of just random stuff you have to do when a studio shuts down. You know, making sure everybody understands because you get your last, they get last paychecks and they got some severance and they got a bunch of other stuff. And I think we were actually in a meeting where one of the TT Corporate people was kind of explaining that to everybody and I got a call from like one of the yearlies and it was like three o'clock in the morning in Germany or whatever. And he like sounded like he was half asleep. And he's like, hey, my brother wanted me to call you and let you know he's gonna come out there and talk to you guys. And like the next day he shows up and uh, yeah, it was all pretty quick. It was like over a couple course of a couple days. And he kind of said, hey, if you can get a bunch of people to show up, you know, then we'll, we'll just form a new studio in, in, in Austin. So I think like 30 something people, I don't remember exactly how many people showed up and that was pretty much it. It wasn't, there wasn't a lot of like, complexity or fanfare or back and forth. It was just sort of like, I met with him, he's like, I like you. <laughs> Let's see if other people like you. See if your team member will show up. And they show up, he's like, all right, they like you too. I guess we'll start a studio. So that was pretty much it. It was a whirlwind where we're in a hotel room somewhere downtown and everybody's you know, blasting through this HR paperwork and Dave and, and Matt are going through the process of forming a corporation and somehow linking it to, to Crytek. And you know they, had, they did all that stuff and it was just, I don't know, one day all of a sudden we're sitting around in an office and we're Crytek USA. It felt like the blink of an eye. And I think we kind of came in with a chip on our shoulder, right? Like our studio just got shut down. We didn't get picked up and we're like, all right, we're gonna show them that we can do some pretty awesome stuff. And we built them. What I thought was a pretty amazing prototype in a very short amount of time. And they were super impressed. They're like, whoa, whoa. And, and I was actually in a meeting where they're like, hey, you guys need to slow down a little bit. Like we're not ready to like start uh, marketing and launching this game. And uh, so well, like I was super proud of what the team did at Crytek. We did an amazing job, and we built a really cool game in a very short amount of time. And a lot of the gameplay that we started to create on Hunt at that Crytek studio were inspired by what we had been doing um, on Crawler at, at Vigil. Very different, but similar in, in some sort of conceptual ways. Whereas when you know stuff started to look shaky with Crytek and our jobs there were in question again, that was when, because Joe and I had thrown around the idea of doing a smaller scale studio before. And that was when I thought, okay, we kind of need to start doing whatever we can to take control of our own destiny again. I read some quote that was like, how many people can make a decision in your life today to screw it up, right? And that means if you look upwards, how many different layers of people are there that can make some decision that would cancel your project or affect your studio or force you to lose your job. And when you're people at the corporate level and then you have shareholders and suddenly you realize there's this massive chain of people that can have a negative impact on what you're doing and your livelihood. And I think that was sort of the motivational point for me to go, okay, let's do a new studio again. Except this time when Joe and I were ready to start something, so we left. I left Crytek. And uh, I think some of the guys who stayed behind had the at Crytek USA had the expectation, or at least the belief or hope, that that would continue, like Crytek would turn it around, because that's in some ways what was being offered or promised. Not really promised, but that was the that was the hope. There was definitely some financial issues, and we just got to the point where we're like, this just doesn't make sense anymore. I mean, you know, we weren't being paid, and it was like, hey, if I'm not going to get paid, I might as well not pay myself. And so we decided to start our own studio. <laughs> yeah, I think after THQ and after Crytek, it was like, all right, a we want to be independent, and we want to get to the point where we're. 100% in control of our destiny. We're not quite there yet. Because the thing is, even when you're an independent studio, like you're beholden to other people, right? If you're doing a project for a publisher, you're beholden to that publisher. And there's a lot of cases where like, it's almost as bad, as, I mean, not that it's bad to be part of a big publisher, but it's the same situation where even if you're independent and you're being published, like the publisher holds all the cards. They can cancel your project. And you're stuck with nothing, basically. And so we've slowly been like, everything we do is geared towards getting to that point where it's like, we're not actually beholden to publishers anymore ultimately to the point where we're funding our own games, and that, I think, is our long-term goal. 
I mean, it takes some time to get there. It's not like something you do from the game, but that's definitely the driving philosophy behind the studio. It didn't seem like such a crazy idea because there were enough successful, like success stories of small teams making these huge games. And it's like, hey, these two guys became millionaires. You know, it was, I think like the, like mobile games and like uh, that market and like just indie developers in general, like having success with these smaller teams sort of made us feel like, hey, maybe the time's right, we should do this. And, you know, we didn't even really know what that would look like, but we started getting more and more serious about it. And it's like, when would the right time be? Um, and so he was wrapping things up uh, at Crytek and I, I had finished my Marvel con contract. So it's like, if it's gonna happen, it's, it's like now, before we get like involved in, in other stuff again. And so, we thought about very seriously, like what would the first game be and who would come on and do this with us? Um, and it just kind of took off from there. And there's only so many chances you get in, in life to, to start new again. And so when things were, when Joe was ready, it was like, now's a good time for me too. So that's really how that decision was made. It's funny because the Nordic contacted us while we were still at Crytek and the time I'm like, nah, we're good. I love Hunt, this is great, this is like one of my dream games. Um, did Darksiders, been there, done, I'm good. And then we started Gunfire and he kind of came back and he's like, hey, what do you think, you wanna work on Darksiders? And at the time we're like, eh. And it gets back again to, not that we didn't wanna work on Darksiders, it got back to that, hey, we wanna be in a position where we control our own destiny. And if we did another Darksiders in when we first started, it would have been an all in type of situation, right? Everybody would've been working on it. It would've been the whole studio. And we would invite back to like, hey, we're beholden to some external entity. And I think we finally got to the point where it was like, hey, we could do Darksiders and it wouldn't make or break us. Like, if Nordic disappeared, fell into a vortex, we could still survive as a studio. And so when we got to that comfort level, we're like, yeah, let's do it. And I think it was actually good because having a gap of time between Darksiders 2 and 3 was really useful as far as like, you know, because if you go back to back to back to sequel, there's always going to be some amount of fatigue. And most studios will manage that by um, people coming on and off of a project or, but when you're a small studio, you can't really do that. You just all end up working on the same thing over and over and over again. And you, you get burned out. Like, you just don't, you run out of ideas. It's not like, you may love the project that you're doing, but at some point you're just like, I'm tapped, I got nothing left. And so having a nice gap between two and three was a good uh, reinvigorating strategy, even though we didn't do it on purpose. But <laughs> when we got back into it, we were like kind of jazzed up and rearing to go again. When we heard that uh, Gunfire was doing Darksiders 3, it was like, you know, it, it was like obviously the logical choice and we were very excited about it. Um, you know, I don't think that we even conceived of building a team that would be big enough to make a Darksiders game. Like it wasn't something that we uh, like wanted to do uh, right out of the gate. So for us, there was like a lot of excitement about what would we do that's not Darksiders? Like what would we do just completely on our own, left to our own devices? Like even with no publisher, just sky's the limit. So there was a lot of excitement in, in doing new stuff. I mean, I, there was definitely moments early on where it felt kind of strange, you know, like reading articles or watching videos and, and like, you know, for me, like reading the script, just being like, oh, I wonder why they did that. Like, why are they doing this kind of thing? And it, it, it was very strange to not be involved in, in the conversations and, and not really knowing where it's going because that was something that I spent years like trying to like track in my mind. And now just like being an observer and like a fan, just like anyone else, I still get people tweeting at me, when are you, you should do Darksiders. Before the Darksiders 3 announcement, it's like, when are you doing this? And it's like, I'm not, man. I'm not. I'm just like as excited about it as you guys are. I'm reading all the articles just like anyone else, man. There's no no involvement. Yeah, I had a trick him in a draw on Fury. What's that? Yeah, because yeah. I'm like, I was like, hey, you want to draw Fury? He's like, I don't know if I'm like, I mean, we'll just have one of our guys draw. That's cool. I mean, it'd be weird to not have you draw one of the main characters yeah. of the Dark Souls. He's like, fine, I'll draw it. <laughs> My next plan was to have someone draw like a really shitty version of Fury and be like, all right, here you go. This is what she's going to look like. Yeah. That really would have got, yeah, he definitely would have drawn it then. Actually, I think he, he was pretty discreet. He's like, do you know anyone that could do some concepts for this stuff? 
And I was like, are you asking me if I can do it? Come on, just ask me. Um, and so he's like, well, yeah, obviously, it would be cool if you could do some, some stuff. And, and so, I mean, it took a while. I was like, as long as you have time, you know, we were in the middle of Battle Chaser stuff. And, and so, you know, I did the, the concept for Fury and like some ideas on how she might look when she's moving, jumping, whatever, just some quick little sketches and uh, just sent that all back to them. And, and, you know, they just took it and like ran with it. It was like, I was like pretty hands off at that point. You know, when you, when you work on the team, there's a lot of iteration that goes into character mm -hmm. creation, but I think they were just like, cool, that's what we need, bye. And they just like built it. And next thing I know, I saw like her running around and attacking and whatever. It was like, just like, it seemed like it happened so quickly. It's just like the way we are with each other. It's funny, it's like, we can't it's just like, flat out ask. It's like, hey, um, do you know anyone who can do this? And it's like, yes, I'll do it, okay? When do you need it? Yeah, the Darksiders franchise, it has a just a huge place in my heart. Like, just being there, helping develop the original one and the second one, it's just it just creating that world and and seeing it evolve and, and, and then seeing like the fans' reaction to it has, has always been amazing. And seeing like the shipping that happens between characters and that you don't expect and uh, and definitely seeing the fan art and then the cosplay is amazing. It's like so exciting and it, it's really cool to see something that you, you know, you put a lot of time and, and effort on um, to see people appreciate it as much as you do when you made it. I think that's probably the best. The support of the fans for for Darksiders has been amazing over the years. Like, you know, obviously when we went into it, we didn't know we were creating something that was gonna last for years and, and have a sequel. I mean, the hope is always there, but sometimes you don't really get another chance to do it. And now there's a third game in development. Uh, and so, you know, just seeing that, hey, this thing has legs and it, it really, gets more popular with each installment and uh, you know people are tattooing these characters on their bodies and stuff uh, like and cosplaying them it's really cool it's a it's a great feeling and you know I think that you know fans especially in this day and age can drive you know the interest of publishers I'm sure THQ is sitting there reading these all these like tweets and like forum posts where's Darksiders 3 uh. Like, I mean, they got bombarded with that since, like, the day after Darksiders 2 shipped. And, like, you know, like, publishers listen to that stuff. So, you know, I think uh, that that support has, has really pushed the franchise, like, to, to move forward. And it's really cool. It's still Darksiders, like, there's still, the DNA of the game is still the same, but, you know, again, getting back to what I said earlier, what I've said before is that you gotta have passion for what you're doing, and, you know, at, over time you evolve, you play new games, you try new things, your tastes change, and so that's gonna naturally get reflected in the game you make. And I think um, it's been really interesting trying to balance that, and this is the double-edged sword of fans, right? Fans expect the game to be like the last game they played, only better. But they don't want it to be exactly the same, because that would be boring, <laughs> but they don't want it to be different, and so you have to, walk this tight edge of like it's the same game but it's not and it's all new and cool and that's been it's a lot of fun honestly it's not it sounds like it could be a grind but it's actually a lot of fun and at the end of the day like you know I love making games a lot of the people here love making games and and I'm always at the philosophy like I'm just gonna make the game I want to make the game I want to play hopefully other people will like it and really that's the only way you can do it because you got to have passion for what you're doing if you don't you're just not gonna make a good game Just a lot of goofy stuff that people would do. Um, oh man, there's, there, we did a lot of pranks. I do remember that. Um, oh man, I can't. There's just weird ones. Um, our uh, our lead designer, he was away, and I think it was in the summertime, which is what made the joke even funnier. Was that we decorated his office like Christmas, 
So when he came back, it was, he couldn't even get into it, his office, because it was just so much Christmas stuff in his office. Yeah, it's the music that they already set it up, isn't it? Wow, it's pretty light. Yeah. Look at that. Look at the stuff on the floor. Exactly. We were trying to debate what the first thing out of your mouth would be, and I said, what the fuck? Or more specifically, what the fuck? What the fuck is going on here? There was that, there was the, the tinfoil, we tinfoil people's offices and stuff like that. There was a lot of inappropriate things, a lot of, a lot of dicks drawn on people's whiteboards. I don't know if I should say that. You can edit that out. But. <laughs> And then when uh, our, uh, our lead level designer, um, Ryan Stefanelli, uh, when he had a kid, he was out on uh, paternity leave. He came back and his office was plastered in baby toys and um, diapers were hanging from the ceiling. Um, so that, that <laughs> there's always some sort of prank going. Uh, it's been a lot of years, but those are two that stuck out in my mind. The number of pranks we pulled on each other, it just felt like a bunch of guys having fun making making a game. So that was, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take that with me forever. Another sound check for you. Sounded great. Mm -hmm. Good. Very rich. I shouldn't have covered up. Maybe that added to the bass. <laughs> Boom. Yeah. Right. Blooper reel.